worship in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And we join together in the prayer of the day. <clears throat> Lord God, before the suffering and death of your one and only Son, you revealed his glory on the holy mountain. Grant that we who bear his cross on earth may behold by faith the light of his heavenly glory, and so be changed into his likeness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The appointed psalm for this weekend is Psalm 148. We'll sing the refrain and verses in Gloria together. pray. God most high, by your word you created a wondrous universe and through your spirit you breathed into it the breath of life. Accept creation's hymn of praise from our lips 
and let the praise that is sung in heaven resound in the heart of every creature on earth to the glory of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> the first two lessons that we read this weekend both have scenes and instances of the glory of God. The first lesson, Elijah is taken up into heaven and does not experience death in this world. But that glorious scene of the, the, the horsemen, the chariots of fire, taking him up to his eternal reward, which the Savior will win for him. And the second lesson refers to that account of Moses spending time on Mount Sinai, receiving the law from God, being in the presence of the glory of God. And when he came back down off the mountain to the people, the reflection of God's glory was so brilliant and so bright and so glorious, the Israelites asked him to put a veil over his face because they couldn't even bear the reflection of the glory. That true glory we see Jesus reveal of himself in the gospel reading for transfiguration. First of all, from 2 Kings chapter 2. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elijah and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied. So be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You've asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet, if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more, says God's word. Second lesson is again a reading from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, today from chapter 2, the end of, uh, from 2 Corinthians, the end of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth paint plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. This is God's word. We stand for the reading of the gospel. Gospel for this final weekend in Epiphany, recorded by Mark in chapter 9. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. 
And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the gospel. We join to speak the verse of the day. Alleluia. A voice came from the cloud. This is my Son, whom I love. Listen to him. Alleluia. And we join to confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. The hymn of the day for this weekend is hymn 97.
May the love of our Lord Jesus draw us to himself. May the power of our Lord Jesus make us strong to do his will. And may the peace of our Lord Jesus fill our lives today and every day. Amen. Study God's word recorded as the gospel for this day from Mark chapter 9. You may be seated. In the name of Jesus Christ, our only Savior. What is the best? People are fascinated by all those rankings and and whether it's something that all society is doing or you're just you're doing it on your own with you know my top 10 songs or top 10 TV shows or something like that we rank so many things and some of them are really hard to rank because you're not always comparing apples and apples sometimes they're really different things that you're trying to compare and it's really complicated to do so sometimes it's not a very easy answer if I'd ask you what is the best sometimes it is a pretty easy answer if I asked you what's the best game you ever played or you ever watched you might have a very easy answer because that's the game your team won the championship or you played better than you'd ever played in your life (laughs) maybe your team actually still lost but you played in a way you had never played before or after and you still remember that one 100 years later and that's that's the best to you or if i ask you what's the best vacation you ever went on you might have an answer just like that because of where you went or maybe just because of who went with you on that vacation and it doesn't matter how many other ones you go on in your life nothing will beat that one because it was there with them kind of an easy answer for some of them how about i i like enjoy this show on tv i haven't watched it all that often but i like the title of it the best thing i ever ate out of all the food you've eaten in your life <laughs> pick the one best thing that you ever ate appetizer Main course, dessert, where are, we, where are we going? There's three totally different answers right there, isn't there? Really difficult to answer that one. But we, we're going to rank best, and it's quite subjective, isn't it? What's going to be best for you? Obviously, that best game when you won the championship, somebody else isn't going to agree because they lost that day. Or maybe you, your best food, someone else is allergic to. We don't want that. You're, you're going to have a personal and subjective best. What about glorious? What's the most glorious thing you ever experienced in your life? (laughs) First of all, when have you ever used the word to describe an event in your life? We say best. Has anything ever been glorious? May not have ever used it. And just like best, it's going to be a subjective thing. Maybe for you, the best, the most glorious thing you ever experienced in your life was the birth of a child. And usually when there's a birth in a a comedy movie or TV show, it's kind of a joke about, oh my goodness, what's all happening there? (laughs) But even with all the stuff that goes on with the birth, your child is put on your chest. You're holding your child. And there will never be a more glorious moment in your life, will there? Again, it's subjective, it's personal, and everybody's gonna have their own ranking system. Today in this lesson, we really do get a glimpse of the most glorious scene ever. And it's glorious because it's it's going to last. The transfiguration event did begin, did end, but the glory that God has is eternal. And the glory that our Savior won for us by his life and death, that will be eternal. And that's what sustains us, whether we're beginning a Lenten season or it's just really cold outside or whatever it is we're struggling with in our lives. The glory of Christ is something that we have been a witness to by faith, just as Peter, James, and John saw with their own eyes. And that glory is going to sustain. It's going to last. It's not going to pass away. And even though Lent is going to begin soon, there is a victory that you and I have because of that glorious savior and that glory is revealed in the darkness of this world and darkness not just because it's winter and night and you know there's three minutes worth of daylight in the winter no the darkness of sin there's only one solution to that which we have and before that suffering and before that horrible scene on good friday jesus reveals his divine nature And how it isn't just a human being who's going to be nailed to a cross six weeks from now. It will be God, but therefore sinless. And a sinless sacrifice will be made, and that glorious victory has been won. 
this event of transfiguration, honestly, we don't know exactly where it happened, and that happens quite a bit in the Bible. Jesus, uh, God kind of reveals some things about, you know, where the garden tomb was and, and where Calvary probably was, and we know where Bethlehem is, and we know the mountain range on which the ark came to rest, but we haven't actually found that yet. But where isn't always the most important thing in the story. If we go there now, do we prove that the transfiguration took place? If we go and find Noah's Ark now today on that mountain range, will that prove that it took place? Or are we going to believe that it's true because God says so in his word? And the world is certainly going to reject that and say that's not a good enough authority. But God says it's there, so it's there. Where it is isn't the important thing. When it happened shows us this is a historical record, and the apostles who witnessed it, witnessed it are putting things in a chronological order we do know that and we do know what happened we honestly don't know exactly where but we know when it was it was six days after jesus predicted his suffering and his death he asked his disciples who do you people say i am and you know you're moses you're elijah you're another one of the prophets you're john the baptist to come back and he said who do you say i am and Peter responded with a great confession of faith. You are the Christ, son of the living God. And then Jesus continued by saying, we are going to Jerusalem. And these are the people, my enemies, those religious leaders, they are going to arrest me. And they are going to punish me. And they are going to put me on trial. And they are going to kill me. I am going to be crucified. And three days later, I will rise. He predicted that all that was going to happen because as God, he knew all of that was going to happen. And he knew exactly when it was going to happen as God. But Peter took him aside, didn't he? Never. This will never happen to you. You're the Christ. It has to happen because he's the Christ. He's the one anointed and sent by the Father to do exactly that. And even though he is perfect and sinless, that sinless sacrifice must be offered or Peter's not forgiven. James and John aren't forgiven. You and I aren't forgiven. So P Jesus predicts that whole event. He's rebuked for it. Jesus rebukes Peter for it. And as is written here, six days later, he took Peter, James, and John with him, led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. So he says, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again. And throughout the Gospels, it kind of seems like the disciples never really caught on to the end of his sentence, did they? They got to, I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to die. And they kind of stopped. I will rise again is a pretty important thing to remember. That will sustain you as you see Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and experience the loneliness of of Easter Saturday but he takes these three with him and he's transfigured and and the way the word is used he's really just revealing what was always his it wasn't just the Sun shining so brilliantly off you know we go outside today and if it was a really sunny day with all that nice white snow out there bring your sunglasses right because it's going to be brilliantly bright this wasn't anything shining on Jesus it was something that came simply from the divine nature he has, not only being fully human, but also being fully God. And even the clothes he was wearing shine brighter and more brilliantly than anyone could ever bleach them. It was a whiter white than you could ever imagine. And simply something that he had. It wasn't like he took off this mask. It was something that was always him. That's, that's the way the word is really used. And he, divines, he reveals that divine glory, which he sets aside and reveals in his humiliated sense. We talk about Jesus' humiliation, setting aside the full use of the power and glory he has as God. He at times revealed his power, all the miracles that he performed. How often does he reveal his divine glory? When he was born, did he shine this brilliantly and that's why the shepherds found him? No, they, is that why the wise men found him? No, the star stopped where he was. He didn't always look like this. He was very unassuming in his appearance, and in his humiliated state, hid that. But after he has predicted his suffering and his death, 
he assures his disciples, do not lose hope. This is who I really am. You're going to pretty much see the opposite of this on Good Friday. Remember this. This is who I am, and this is why there is a victory. And while the transfiguration is taking place, they're speaking. That goes on. First of all, Moses and Elijah appear. And a couple weeks ago, I asked in a message, if humanly speaking, is there a greater human in the Bible than Moses? But Moses was only, as we saw in that second lesson today, he's only reflecting God's glory when he comes down off the mountain, isn't he? And Moses is appearing, and Elijah is appearing. Two great humans, as far as we're concerned in the Old Testament, showing us that when we leave this world, that there is something next. And it's something glorious because of the Savior's victory over sin and death and the devil. The other gospel writers record for us that they are there speaking with Jesus about his upcoming suffering and death. So in the middle of fully revealing his divine glory, he's also fully human, being encouraged to accomplish that saving work that only he could do so that they would enter that eternity of glory. So that Peter, James, and John, so that you and I, so all believers, would have that eternal, glorious reward. They are speaking with Jesus, but what they say isn't the most important thing in the lesson. Peter, of course, is going to chime in. He's always talking, sometimes without always thinking, first. And he often gets a bad rap for always talking and sometimes putting his foot in his mouth. But kind of, there's another, another account in the Gospels that says that they had fallen asleep. Jesus says, pray with me while we're here by ourselves on this mountain. And when they woke up, this is the scene that they see. And that would pretty much scare me too. But Peter says, this is great. You want the best day ever? You want the most glorious thing ever? As wonderful as it is to have your baby on your chest. To be in the presence of God's glory. Fully revealed. Yeah, I'm going to agree with Peter. It's good to be here. But can you really put up three shelters and Peter, James, and John, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah stay there forever and never go down off the mountain? Jesus isn't going to save the world if he doesn't come down off the mountain. But like Mark says here, Peter didn't know what to say because he was so frightened. Maybe because he was told to pray with Jesus and he fell asleep on the job. And when he woke up, that's how Jesus looked. But Jesus wasn't here to punish, was he? So Moses and Elijah are speaking but that's not the most important thing. Peter is speaking, but we can't do what Peter suggests. Then the Father speaks. That one's the one we need to pay attention to. The Father speaks, This is my Son, whom I love. Listen to him. Remember that prediction six days earlier, where Jesus says, This is going to happen to me. I will suffer, I will die, and I will rise and your sins will be forgiven. That's what you have been waiting for for generations on top of generations. That one Messiah who would come, the only one qualified for the job, and he would accomplish it. Horrible though those events were. And the Father says, listen to him. Everything Moses wrote was important. We talked about that in that Deuteronomy lesson a couple weeks ago. It was all good, but it was all God's words. And Moses had said, there will be another prophet coming, and you must listen to him. And the Father says exactly that here. Listen to him. What he says is the truth. And then just like that, the whole thing's done. The transfiguration is over. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. Transfiguration's over. That glorious scene is over. Jesus looks like himself again. Moses and Elijah have returned to heaven where, where, where Jesus has already won that place for them. And they come down off the mountain, as we just sang, because he has to ascend another mount, that hill of shame. This one, the most glorious mountain scene ever. But he's got to go to Mount Calvary to fully forgive the world. And that's where Jesus speaks. Not just Moses and Elijah or Peter, but Jesus speaks and says, Don't tell anyone what you've seen until I have risen from the dead. Remember again what Peter's response was to that prediction of his death. Nope, never. This will not happen to you. 
And you can say, yeah, you're, you're the Christ. No, nobody can beat you, but Jesus must die to win the victory. That's how God establishes the plan of salvation. And with all the confusion about who Jesus was, is he just a miracle worker? Is he a prophet? Is he just some guy from Nazareth? And we can't really explain what he's doing. But he can't be the Messiah because he doesn't look like our idea of the Messiah. The people who believed in him had all kinds of questions about it. The people who had rejected him and didn't believe in him had all kinds of questions about him. And Jesus said, you are witnesses of this glorious scene. Don't tell anybody until I've risen from the dead. Then you will be able to put all these pieces together and it will make one complete story of the salvation of the world. We've titled the message this weekend, Witness the Glory of Christ. And Peter, James, and John certainly were witnesses of that. But there's really two uses of the word, aren't there? One, witness it and see the event. They were there. And throughout the New Testament, we have writers say, we are witnesses of this. We have seen his glory, John would say in chapter 1. And, all, and Paul would even speak of these great cloud of witnesses. All these people that saw what Jesus did. The ones who heard what he said. They were witnesses. And then they were to be witnesses and share that message. Jesus doesn't tell Peter, James, and John to keep this message to themselves forever. He says, hold on to this for now and share it after my resurrection. And you and me, we are witnesses of the same event. We're not on that mountain. Like we said before, we don't even know which mountain he was actually on. But we do know what happened because God wrote this down for us in his word. And there's no errors in his word. Everything in this book is true. So if this is what happened to Jesus, this is what happened. And if the father says, listen to my son, it's appropriate for us to listen. Just as Peter, James, and John were told to listen. And just as they saw and then spoke, so we see through faith, through the word, and then speak. Isn't that really the only message that this dark world needs? We want to, to lighten things. We want to be bright. We want brilliance. We want glorious, not just for a certain group of people, but for the world. What other glorious message is there other than every single one of you is a sinner and can't change the fact, can't change the situation? But he did. And you've been witnesses of that and God says, see it, and then speak it. You and I need that message. Our, our families and friends, our neighbors need that message. Literally, the entire world needs it. Because without this glory of Christ, there is nothing but darkness. Glory, we said, is that personal and subjective thing. The real, lasting, eternal glory it isn't in a game, even though you might remember it for a long, long time. It really doesn't last the way Christ's glory does. It's not a vacation that you went to and then came home from when the vacation was over. And it's not a food that you ate and then ate something else. None of those, as glorious as they can be in this world, none of those compare with the real glory, the real victory, which is our Savior's, and therefore ours through faith as well. It's not a message just to make us feel good this weekend before we got to start feeling bad on Wednesday and feel bad for six weeks. Lots of people have felt bad for a year because of everything that's been going on. What message is really going to cheer? Wouldn't it be great to say, if you want to wear one, you can, but you don't have to anymore. You don't have to wear the mask. And the car's always going to start no matter what the weather. And you're always going to have perfect relationships. with people. Those would all be wonderful, but they're not happening in a sinful world. The only lasting glory comes from Christ. And that, we're not just trying to feel good now. We do feel good because that victory is sure. That is a changeless glory. May we see it and speak it and witness it. And the peace of God which passes our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand for the prayers that continue our worship order today. We praise you, Father, for the precious gift of your Son. 
and for his glorious transfiguration on the holy mountain. Give us the firm resolve to listen to your son, the eager readiness to believe his promises, and the joyful willingness to heed his commandments. By the sign of Moses and Elijah, show us that blessed are the dead who die in faith, for they shall know the power of Christ's resurrection and shall be changed from glory into glory. O God and Father, let your Holy Spirit find a dwelling in our poor bodies and transform our weak, sinful lives into the radiance of goodness, purity, and righteousness. Transform our minds, understanding, judgments, our whole persons to reflect the mind of Christ. Take our sickness and pain, disappointments and despair, sorrows and mourning, pride and anger, selfishness and envy, hate and fear, Take all these, Father, and transform them by the healing touch of Jesus into noble impulses, pure motives, kind thoughts, constructive deeds, high courage, and true faith. Look on your church, Lord, here and in every place, and grant that we and all who bear the name of Christ may daily offer up to you the acceptable sacrifices of repentance, thanksgiving, and loving obedience. And as we have seen the events of, your sav of our Savior's transfiguration, may we too speak the message of his glory to others and, grant, and ask that you would grant a blessing to all of our efforts to share that message around the world. We also ask your blessing, Lord, that you would keep us and our possessions, our pets, our livestock, our vehicles, all those things, keep them all safe and running well and protected during this time of, of cold weather. We ask for your blessing and protection on all who must be outside during this time. And if it is your will, Lord, please grant us favorable weather that we may resume our daily activities always to the glory of your saving name. Hear us also, Lord, as we join to pray the prayer our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever <coughs> and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. May be seated. We'll begin with the lectern side. Lord Jesus, we thank you for coming to us in such a personal and special way in this sacrament. We ask that you would give us a deeper understanding, appreciation, and belief in the real presence, that we have received not only bread and wine, but also your very body and blood, 
in, with, and under those earthly elements. May the reception of this sacrament lead us to love you and serve others as you would have us do as your redeemed children. May we be the salt of the earth and light of the world you have called us to be. We ask this in the name of our Savior, who lives and reigns with the Father and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. May be seated for the closing hymn, hymn number 95.